a lot of game populations kind of really hit a low point there right around maybe the turn of the century, early 1900s, um, certainly through the 1930s. That was a low point. And, and we've recovered a lot of those game species, ducks and, and white-tailed deer are good examples and wild turkeys are good examples. We've recovered a lot of those species, um, recovered in the sense that there's sustainable populations now, but especially in the case of ducks, you know, we still have a fraction of what would have existed you know, before, uh, before we settled North America. But, um, yeah, in terms of hunting, I, I think hunting has become more difficult, uh, for a few reasons. One would be less game species. I think the game species that are here now are hunted harder. And so they're smarter in a way. Um, and then just in general availability of, of places for people to hunt is pretty limited now too. And that, that just makes it harder to even get into the sport. This is the Aptitude Outdoors podcast, where we interview travelers, explorers, and outdoorsmen and women to bring you the best tips and stories from around the world. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Aptitude Outdoors podcast. Today, we're joined by John Simpson of the Winus Point Marsh Conservancy and Winus Point Shooting Club. So, John, how are you doing today, man? Good, good. I'm glad to be here and excited to talk about uh, all the great stuff we're doing. I've heard about Winus Point from a few different places. Uh, it was brought to my attention when I did a podcast with the Black Swap Conservancy and Rob Crane, their director, was like, you talk to these guys. I was reading a book about bird conservation, and uh, while I was doing an episode a few months back with Black Swamp Bird Conservancy, keep coming up with Winus Point. Winus Point keeps coming up here locally in, you know, the Northwest Ohio region. So before we talk about Winus Point, I'd like to know what compelled you to want to study ducks? That's just not like a thing that seems like a common ground (laughs) that people would want to study. So where did this passion for ducks come from? Because duck hunters are very passionate people and, you know, they're very, very into ducks. So what drew you specifically to that? Yeah, you're right. Duck hunters are are very passionate people. And uh, when I was young, I was kind of bitten by the hunting bug and uh, and eventually by the duck hunting bug. And uh, that, you know, that really got me super interested. And when I was going to when I was doing my undergraduate degree in wildlife biology, um, there's just a ton of opportunities in ducks, too. You know, there's people spend a lot of money on duck conservation and duck research. And uh so it was something I was passionate about, and there was also a lot of availability to do that sort of thing uh, and some really cool cutting-edge science on ducks. So that's that's what got me into it. It's uh, it's a exciting field. Yeah, and so from what I can gather, your, your path kind of ended up at Winus Point. You did some research there back in 2005. So what, what was that research project about? Because I'm always interested to learn even the micro nuance of, like, the Great Lakes region and anything that has to do with conservation, ecology, all of that stuff. So... What was your uh, what was your pros- project back then? Sure, yeah, I've been involved in Great Lakes uh, mallard research for a long time now. So uh, after my uh, undergraduate, I uh, graduated and I got a job with Ducks Unlimited Canada in southern Ontario studying mallard ducks. I spent a year uh, working on that mallard duck research project. And then um, that project was ending. The same thing, studying Great Lakes breeding mallards was starting in in Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin in 2001. And I spent uh, three, three and a half years working on that project, too. Um, and, then, and then I've, you know, through my career and my job since then, I've, I've, I've spent t- close to 20 years now, I guess, researching mallard ducks in the Great Lakes. Wow. Mallards are... It's funny because the more common the animal, I think the less interested people are in them. So is there anything that would like surprise people about mallard ducks? Because like they they walk in the middle of the road by my house from they're like swimming the ditches and stuff out here in, in corn country. So well, is there anything that you would be like, people probably don't know this about mallards. So um, what we're starting to find out in some of the some of the more recent research that I'm involved in uh, is looking at the mixing of genes in mallard ducks. And so what we're starting to find out is that uh, the the East Coast is largely uh, a lot of European uh, genes, mallard genes that come from farm raised ducks. And those genes have mixed quite considerably all the way into the Great Lakes population. Um, But the 
the classic prairies migrating down to Arkansas and um, uh, the, the southern Mississippi River Basin. That's still a pure wild population. So we kind of have these two two uh, populations of mallards in, in North America, and they're mixing in the middle here in the Great Lakes. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's uh, human beings are pretty good at uh, intermixing species from all over everywhere with everything. That's like our main... I think we're like that's what we're best at is accidentally like messing with animal populations. <laughs> we're good, especially here in the Great Lakes. We're just like <laughs> having a ball with it. So, is there anything that out at at Winus Point that you? I mean, been around for a long time. I mean, yeah. was it you're the oldest surviving conservation like bird conservation club in America? I mean, what? How long have you oh, been yeah. around? And yeah, this is a good kind of a good time to touch on the history of Winus Point a little bit. So um, we started the Winus Point Shooting Club started in or is incorporated in 1856, um, which makes it the oldest continuously operating duck hunting club in North America. Um, There was a few that started earlier out of business now. Um, We've hunted every year since 18, well, before 1856. Um, but incorporated in 1856. Uh, and the guys that, that you know, the, the businessmen from Cleveland that started the duck hunting club here, they were deeply interested in conservation and ecology, you know, in the 1800s, um, right back to the beginning of the club. And sort of that ethic has kind of continued through the club, um, to, you know, through all the graduate students we and research projects and conservation projects that we sponsored over time. And and now we have the Winus Point Marsh Conservancy, the nonprofit that runs and operates and owns and manages uh, all of our property and all of our uh, research, conservation and education projects. That's that's a long time. And it's interesting when you think back that far that people started to have that conservation mindset and ethic because, I mean, anybody who even studies briefly the history of the United States knows that, like, there was this period where we just shot anything that moved and we just wiped it out. Why do you think that, even way back then, why do you think the people who started the club started to have this conservation mindset? Do you think they were seeing just year after year numbers go down and they're like, we got to do something about this? Or what What was their mindset back then? It's not common. Yeah, but, no, no, I think that's exactly it. You I mean, you talked about that period of time where where we settled North America and and largely wiped out or nearly wiped out, you know, many species, in, including popular game species. And that's really where that conservation ethic came from. You know, a lot of those guys at that point in time in the 1800s became very concerned about the loss of all the species. Um, And here, in you know, we can go back through our old records and we can see them talking about um, wasteful or a lack of game laws and a need for game laws and a need for bags and limits. Um, We can see them talking about invasive species, even water quality and habitat change. Uh, Even in the 1870s and 1880s, they were already talking about that kind of stuff. Um, So the same stuff we talk about today, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, the the from the reading and the, the talking to all the different people I've got to talk to over the years. There seems to be a continual trend of there's a ton less wildlife than there was Oh, like 100 years ago or say so because, you know, we're consistently before large-scale farming and stuff of that that, like, maintains our populations now. People were out there hunting that contributes. And then, you know, but even before that, I mean, the market hunting for furs and stuff that we don't really take part in much anymore as much was a big deal. So do you think that that's true or, like, we seeing way less numbers of, well, like, especially in your c- case, duck populations? And is it on the hunting side, is it harder now to hunt than it was? Or is that just a way for us to cover up how bad we are hunting? (laughs) Well, uh, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, a lot of game populations kind of really hit a low point there right around maybe the turn of the century, early 1900s, Um, certainly through the 1930s, that was a low point. And and we've recovered a lot of those game species, ducks and, and white-tailed deer are good examples and wild turkeys are good examples. We've recovered a lot of those species. 
um, recovered in the sense that there's sustainable populations now, but especially in the case of ducks, you know, we still have a fraction of what would have existed, you know, before, uh, before we settled North America. But um, yeah, in terms of hunting, I, I think hunting has become more difficult uh, for a few reasons. One would be less game species. I think the game species that are here now are hunted harder. And so they're smarter in a way. Um, and then just in general, availability of, of places for people to hunt is pretty limited now too. And that, that just makes it harder to even get into the sport. Hey, everybody, thanks for checking out this episode. If you feel like you're getting something out of it, go down in the link below and buy me a coffee. The Aptitude Outdoors podcast is fully self-funded by me. So if you're digging it, you know, I'm just throwing out a tip jar and I appreciate you listening. Let's dive right back into this episode. Yeah, I was curious if you had any thoughts on if if the technology we have now levels the playing field a little bit, though, because, you know, I spent the last 10 years fishing just out there blind in a rowboat. And then within the last like two months, I've, I bought a fish finder finally because I got so sick of being terrible at it. And it's like that just completely changed the game of everything that I've been doing because it's like I can see them under me. I almost feel guilty. Like this is this is like not fair. But do you, do you think that technology's leveled the playing field at all for even people like me who've gotten into this in the last, you know, five, six years, the, the bows even from 15 years ago are like basically fine-tuned rifles at this point in time. Like it's not the entry level. I don't think is as difficult at this point, but I, I don't know. I'm going off the rails here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Technology has, has technology and, and technology, including social media has, has made it easier. Uh, and, and, and it helped people get into hunting and stuff, uh, love, the playing field to some extent, but it's also, uh, you know, increased our success rates and our, and our take of wildlife. And so it, it causes a little management challenges that way too. Oh, I never thought about that. So with speaking of management challenges, you know, marshlands are interesting and they're not, you know, unique to the Great Lakes or anything, but the, you, the Great Lakes in and of themselves are a unique place in the world. I mean, they're, they're, huge, huge inland lakes, essentially oceans. And you're right on the edge of Lake Erie, which we're always hearing about, especially right now with the algal bloom seasons just starting to pop up. Does that have any effect on what you guys do at Winus? Like, is any of those issues with Lake Erie directly affecting the marshland? Because you're kind of like the the lungs, I guess, or like the filter, whether it be like the kidney or the liver of the lake, I guess. <laughs> Sure. So, so some of that stuff historically has really affected our marshlands. Um, you know, pre, pre 1800s, um, there was tens of thousands or, or maybe hundreds of thousands of coastal marsh in Lake Erie. And that's almost all gone now. There's maybe 30, 35,000 acres of coastal marsh left in Lake Erie. And all of that marsh, for the most part, has dikes around it, big earthen berms that separate it from the lake. Um, so the changes in water quality and invasive species largely caused the loss of most of that marshes. Now our marshes, you know, they're protected by dikes, but they're also excluded from the lake system. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have water, natural water flow daily passing through our marshes like we had at one point in time. Um, so that creates a water quality challenge right there because the kidneys of the lake are cut off from the lake uh, for a large part. Wow. That's like, I always kind of get in my own head when like the, the further you start thinking about this stuff, the more wild it gets because like we've, humans are just really good at like what we do. We're like obviously the best in the world at it. We're world-class at like making things work and just being able to exploit any situation when it comes to getting food, getting water, whatever, like we know how to just do it. And we got to a point there for a long time where we got so good at it, it just started messing up like all this natural stuff. And then we get, we're, we're at this like complete opposite end where we're like trying to recreate it, but in like these unnatural ways that it's, it's such a weird, we're like backpedaling essentially to try and like really like figure it out in real time of how to fix these. So, you know, did the, did the marshes, recover to a point where they're like healthy now or there's still ongoing issues because they're such fragile ecosystems like yep. 
carp can destroy them or like any animal that comes in that's not native to these areas can just drastically screw with them. Yeah, so the the marshes we have now, um, you know, the dikes protect them. That's the reason we still have marshes here now. Otherwise, we wouldn't have them. Um, but we and they're they're really well uh, managed now. State and federal and private agencies really manage the the marshes well for wildlife and everything else. Um, but we still have our challenges too. You know, there's invasive plant species and carp are still present. Um, you know, water quality is still an issue in some ways. So. Um, you know, there's there's always ongoing ongoing threats and things we have to manage. What's what would you say right now is some of the biggest stuff that's kind of you're facing, or that you, the struggle the, that's hardest for Winus Point specifically with conservation efforts or, or ecology or any of that stuff. Yeah, so there's two big things we're working on, or at least challenges to our marsh management. And one is invasive plant species, mostly plant species right now. Phragmites, you know, is widespread across yeah. the southern Great Lakes, especially in, in uh, southwestern Lake Erie. Um, so we're always working on Phragmites and trying to, to keep our plant, our wetland plant ecosystems healthy and, and diverse and, and hopefully with very little Phragmites. Um, then there's a few other plant species too, um, invasive plant species. Flowering rush is another one we spend a lot of time trying to control and manage. Um, and then the last few years, the, the natural water levels in Lake Erie have been so high that that's causing us a lot of marsh management challenges because marshes by design are, are naturally shallow water, uh, environments. And, you know, when the lake is two or three feet higher than normal, um, if our marshes are two or three feet higher than normal, they're going to turn into a lake too, and we'll lose all that vegetation. So that's been another challenge for us, actually keeping the water, ironically enough, out of the marshes. Wow. Is that, do you think the the lake levels being higher a climate change issue, or is that just a, a multitude of factors? I mean, what what's causing the lake to get just, because it's been, it's getting to get higher and higher and higher over time. So like, what what do you, in your opinion, what do you think is the cause of that? I think it's mostly just natural lake level fluctuations, you know, over the long term, like geologic terms. Um, you know, humans have some influence on that. We've we've manip- manipulated like each each end of of Lake Erie by dredging through the Detroit River and and uh, controlling water down at Niagara Falls. Um, so the the lake levels and the fluctuations have changed a little bit, but it's mostly mostly natural cycles related to precipitation. Interesting. So on a, from the duck perspective, what, cause I, I've never duck on it. I have been invited to a few times and it just, I couldn't make it happen just because of the timing and stuff, but specifically for ducks, waterfowl of any kind, what draws them to a marsh that makes this such, you know, prime duck hunting habitat? Yeah. So historically when the Linus Point Shooting Club first started, um, Muddy Creek Bay and Sandusky Bay had re- had relatively clear water and huge, you know, thousands of acres of, of emergent vegetation. There was a lot of wild rice and a lot of wild celery, especially, and that attracted diving ducks, canvasbacks, and redheads. That's why uh, duck hunters and our club, and, they, and there's other clubs around the, bays, the bay too, that's why they all were attracted to, to form clubs and start hunting here was because of those vegetation species and those duck species. Um, nowadays it's changed a little bit. The water quality has changed. The wild celery, the wild rice is gone. Um, our, our marshes are impounded now. Um, but we can use those impounded marshes. We can manage the water levels inside and grow a lot of beneficial, um, moist soil plants, seed bearing plants. Um, and that attracts now babbling ducks. So we get mallards, teal, gadwall, black ducks. Um, and we can do a really good job, or I feel like a really good job of managing our marshes to attract those dabbling duck species. So that's how we, we manage the marshes now. Yeah. And, you know, ducks are one of the coolest looking birds when you get up close. They just have like such unique fe- features and their feathers can be like shiny and, and all this cool stuff. I mean, this is like my five-year-old me. Like what's the coolest duck? Because there's there's a ton of duck species, but I mean everybody's got to have a favorite. Like everybody says, yeah. they don't have a favorite kid or a favorite nephew or something. Like you got your favorite. Which ones? Duck world. What's your favorite? 
Yeah, so every duck hunter has their favorite duck. Everyone picks one out. Uh, mine's blue wing teal. I, I think they're really uh, uh, an attractive duck. Um, they're a lot of fun to hunt for, and they're great. They're great table fare to eat, so I like I like the blue wings, yeah. <laughs> no, those are cool looking birds. I've I've gotten into like wildlife photography a lot in the last you know decade, also, and the I always thought people were like duck taking pictures of ducks is difficult, and I was like, how hard could it be? Because like I, there's mallards all over. I, I like almost hit them with my car five times a week because they're just walking in the middle of the road by my house. And then you go out there and you like take one step too close and they just blow up and they're gone. So with duck hunting, I can imagine everyone that I know that duck hunts has said it's very difficult. So what's, what are some of the, from a hunting side, what's some of the harder parts of the sport in and of itself? Because like those things scare easily. Like what's the biggest yeah. challenge for you? Yeah, well, there's, I, I guess there, there's a couple ways to answer that question and um, I would say you're, you're spot on one thing though, and that's disturbance. Like ducks have a pretty strong survival instinct and once hunting season rolls around, they catch on really quick and, uh, they're not going to stick around with any disturbance, uh, hunting or otherwise. So, um, we try and manage our disturbance a lot. You know, we only hunt a couple days a week and we spread our hunting out over different areas and we don't want to basically educate the ducks to where the, what times and where the hunters are going to be. Um, but in like broader terms, just what, what's difficult about duck hunting is, you know, one of the difficult things for people getting into duck hunting is there's just a ton of specialized gear and knowledge and a lot of gear, uh, in a lot of cases. So it's a, it's a tough kind of hurdle to get over to, to start duck hunting. If you, if you're looking to start. Yeah. I've found that, you know, uh, (laughs) people that I was going to go with were like, Oh, just show up. If you got some waders and a gun, you'll be good. I'm like, dude, it's like 30 degrees outside. (laughs) Like this could be, uh, pretty wild. So I've seen instances where ducks, they'll even congregate in like flooded cornfields and they'll, uh, does that because it kind of simulates a marsh or is that just because they are just going to go to any open water they're flying over if they're tired? It simulates a marsh and, you know, in the case of a flooded cornfield, there's some probably some high energy food corn in there that they're after waste grain or whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, especially as the fall progresses on later and later into the fall, ducks really key in on food. Uh, You know, they need a lot of high energy food to make it through the cold temperatures but uh, also to prepare for the, the fall migration or the winter migration when they eventually move further south. So, you know, this kind of, I like to read old hunting and fishing like books about how people used to hunt and fish because they were still just as successful. And we have all this insane technology now that you can literally just find anything anywhere There's like heat tracking and you know, you can see 5,000 yards away with a, with a scope or something. And we just have so much high-end technology. And then you got these dudes back in the day that just understood the ecology, the wildlife movement habitats, what they did, because they're so much more connected to the outdoors in general. I mean, a lot of people were working in the outdoors or farming, and they're just observing this from the time they're born until the time they die. Um, so in, in your opinion, how important – Is it to understand the actual wildlife that you're hunting versus leaning on that technology? I already know my answer. I've said it a hundred billion times, but, you know, for people that are looking to get into any sort of hunting, you know, what's, what do you, what is your thought on that? Learning. Yeah, so that's a, that's an interesting, interesting question to ask me because here at Winus Point, we kind of make a, we we go out of our way to maintain some traditions and to hunt in the traditional way, or, or at least in the traditional way, you know, that we've hunted here for 170 some years at Winus Point. Um, and so a key component of that is is understanding the game that we're after and, and sort of having that baseline knowledge or woodsmanship, if you will. Um, and not relying on technology so much. Um, a lot, you know, a lot of hunters today, and, and I'm not knocking them, it's, but uh, a lot of hunters today really rely on technology to, to get them past a lot of that sort of basic woodsmanship that, uh, that would go a long way, I think, in making people better hunters. I would 100% agree with that. I like, I like the challenge of learning 
but ha- like deer hunting. I learned more from, you know, reading a couple old books and just literally sitting in my deer stand watching them at 150 yards away, like just what they're doing. And that's led me to more success than any piece of technology ever could. So that's what, because I got friends that I, that want to, you know, start doing this with me because I didn't get in this traditionally like anyone else, you know, I, I just kind of got older and fell into it. I wanted to, to, you know, do that for myself. And I wanted to like learn more about ecosystems and food and, and all of this stuff and all these different nuanced issues, whatever that people talk about now. But they're always like, what gear do I need? What gear do I need? I was like, dude, just read read study the habitats of deer and it's going to come together a lot faster than like buying the newest rifle and scope like people are killing deer i love those older photos where it's just a dude in jeans and like a big red checkered coat like he didn't have camo on he just like knew where they at they were at all the time because he lived on the farm or whatever so i think that's really awesome now on on the flip side i always get interested in the 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 debate about like decoys and even in the fishing side of things there's like five trillion plastics for bass and whatever do you think that like more realistic decoys are playing a huge part in success or are you, like i have these old floating decoys that i got like at a garage sale up behind me like do you think does it matter is what i'm asking do these does like having the highest end decoy matter or is it just kind of a temporary thing for them to see briefly and be like, ah, it's safe. Uh, to a point, you know, of, co- of course you need a, a somewhat realistic decoy. But at, at, in the case of ducks, uh, you know, at some point the duck is going to be close enough to shoot and it doesn't matter how realistic your decoy is because you don't need to get it any closer. So, you know, a lot of the really, really fine detail that's on decoys and gear and camouflage even um, these days, I think is mostly designed to attract hunters more than it is to attract the game. (laughs) There's a little bit of marketing going on there. Yeah, they always, everybody always says, you know, fishing gear is meant to attract fishermen, not fish. So <laughs> I've seen, I always saw a video yesterday on YouTube. I was just like looking through when I was uploading something and it was like a guy took a block of wood and put some treble hooks on it and he just caught like a huge bass. He just like threw it in the lake. I'm like, what am I doing spending any money on lures? Like what, what is wrong with me? But anyway, I hear you got a dog back there, you know, that's yep. classic, classic duck hunting. Do you use dogs to duck hunt? I, I do. Yeah, I have two myself. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, th- there's others at the club. We have we have guides that take our members out. Some of the members have their own dogs and most of our guides have dogs. So we try to always have a dog with, with every group. The uh, the dog thing has just been brought to my attention over and over. You must have some extreme patience. I don't know if I could take the time to train a dog that that way. Is it is it a difficult process like to train a dog to hunt because they can be impatient, especially like a lab or something where they're just high energy dogs. How do you train a dog to to be that calm and and focused? Yeah, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question because I'm not much of a <laughs> I'm not much of a dog trainer. Um, my dogs have been pretty good or good enough. Um, mine sort of get trained by default. I mean, based based on where they live and how much exposure they get to it, they they don't have much choice. They just kind of learn uh, to duck hunt. But uh, yeah, there's certainly people with a ton of skill, time, and patience that that put a lot of work into training dogs. I'm yeah. not one of those. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, assuming by your job and and what you do for a living, they probably, yeah, they just kind of naturally pick up on it by force or being stuck out there. Uh, So are there any cool projects that Winus is working on right now that you're excited about? I mean, there's always work to be done in conservation day in and day out, but anything that you're really looking forward to or in the midst of? Yeah, absolutely. So the the Winus Point Marsh Conservancy, we have a whole lot of projects and programs that we're working on, not just, not just on our property too, but in the region. Um, One of the really cool ones we're working on right now is a cooperative project between uh, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, and then us in Ohio, um, continuing some of this mallard duck research. Uh, So last year and this year, and then again, next year, between the five states, we're going to put hundreds of satellite transmitters on uh, female mallard ducks and track their spring and fall migration and their nesting areas and their settling patterns and uh, survival rates and get all sorts of cool information from those. So we're about a year into that project now. I think there's close to a hundred 
satellite transmitters out there right now on Hen Mallards, um, kind of scattered all across the Great Lakes region. So that's a, that's a really exciting one that we're working on right now and kind of near and dear to my heart because it continues some of my graduate work I started on. That's really awesome. I, I love that. Uh, you know, like the research side of things in conservation, wildlife conservation specifically, just the way that they're able to monitor and track these species is so cool. Like this is stuff that you would never be able to do like a long time ago. Do you guys take part in like the banding and stuff? Is that even, do they even do that with ducks? I'm not quite sure. Yeah. So we banned a number of species out here. Uh, we banned waterfowl, um, mostly black ducks, wood ducks, and mallards, but we, we banned a, a wide variety of waterfowl, um, summer and winter banding periods. So we're in the middle of our summer banding period right now. Um, we also banned and monitor common terns. There's, there's two populations of common terns in Ohio, only two. Um, and we manage those two turn, turn colonies and band all those young. And then we have all sorts of, we don't do it, but there's, there's all sorts of people that come out here and band songbirds and, and other birds too. So that's big, big programs for us. Do you have, uh, do you like have during like the big birding season that we have here in Northwest Ohio, do they have public access out there where people can like go and, and watch birds or is it completely private? So our, our property is completely private. Um, but during the biggest week in birding, the Black Swamp Bird Observatory has three um, tours that come out here. And so people that are interested in birding out here can get a hold of them and sign up for those tours. Um, and we do three guided tours out here during that week. That's awesome. I, I need to check that out next year because we just went through that whole season this year and I talked with the uh, Black Swamp Bird Observatory and they did, they're doing awesome things too. I think one of the interesting things is with, with what they do and what you do are like on the same page, but they're kind of like different because you have the hunting side of it, which can like puts a lot of people off. But the thing that I try and relate to people so often is like, you can like hate hunting. You can say whatever you want about hunters and, and the people who hunt, but like the funding for most conservation work is through hunting, fishing, like all of these activities. So like, that's what my, like one of my bigger goals in life is to educate people because I'm on both sides of the coin. Like I enjoy your general outdoor recreation, backpacking, hiking, kayaking, just for the the joy of being outdoors. But I also enjoy the hunting side and the fishing side and getting my own food and things of that nature. Do you have any kind of thoughts on that, on how to bridge that gap between like the non-consumptive and the consumptive user and the way that they view conservation because on the coming from the side of a non-consumptive user of the outdoors it's just like a thing like there's parks and you go to them and you don't really think too much about who's making sure that this happens have you had any success in kind of bridging that gap because it's a difficult gap to bridge it's like trying to yeah. convince a vegan to eat a steak you're like I can't probably, it's probably going to be one of the hardest things you have to do. No, I think one of the biggest, so, so you're right, you know, uh, hunting, the, the, the fees and taxes and, and all the mandatory stuff that's, that's associated with hunting, um, you know, that pays for and funds a bulk of, of what we describe as conservation nowadays. Um, and, that, and I don't want to take away from that because that does a ton, but, uh, you know, long-term that that's, probably not sustainable and probably not enough funding to really accomplish widespread conservation. And so us as hunters who are kind of leading the charge for conservation, we really have to think about how we're going to reach out to everyone else that's non-consumptive and get them enthused and engaged and activated and not hunters, but financially involved in, in, in increasing what we have available for conservation. And that's going to be a really big challenge because as hunters, we got a, a vested interest in conservation. And so we're, we're willing, uh, whether it's mandatory or voluntary, we're willing to spend money on, on it. But, uh, you know, non-consumptive users don't have that vested interest and, and we need to educate them and get them involved because hunters can't do it all forever. Yeah, and, and it, it, the model of, like, the American model of conservation is essentially 
reliant on people continually buying stuff. I mean, like buying guns and ammo and hunting licenses, which are required every year. And, and you know, you got like the duck stamp or whatever. You know, it's like all this stuff is required to hunt these animals. But it's like, how long is that going to be sustainable forever? I mean, if there's less hunters, then there's less money going into conservation. So, you know, I see these giant, like these pushes between like get more people hunting and then there's other people are like, we have enough people hunting, then we're going to overwhelm areas. And it's probably different for you guys since you're a private club. Like not everybody can come there and hunt, which is, you know, a good way to keep numbers down and stuff. But on a, on a like an overall ethic level, what do you think about that? Do you think more people should get involved in hunting or are we in a place where there's like too many people or I don't know. It's, it's a toss up all the time in my head. Yeah. I, I personally think that in terms of conservation, just specifically speaking about conservation, you know, obviously the, to, to maintain a hunting culture, we need to, to and get more people involved in hunting. Um, but I don't think, that's an effective way to increase and maintain conservation funding. I think just speaking about conservation, we really need to get the general public involved in that and funding that for a bunch of reasons. And one is because a lot of the, or most of the hunting conservation funds are targeted towards huntable species and game species and game species of fish. And, um, you know, we really fall short when it comes to, other species, amphibians and non-game species and passer and birds, all of which are experiencing serious population declines. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our hunting conservation do, dollars do a lot of great work, but they fall short in those regards. And we need to engage the general public in funding conservation for long-term sustainability. And that's, you know, that's hard. That is hard because I, a lot of the time, you know, someone like you or, you know, anybody like fronting a conservation organization. You know, I've talked to tons of people who are running conservation organizations and I'm even here on this podcast. We're all screaming from the mountaintops like, yo, we need to do something about this. Like, this is really important. Even if you don't hunt, whatever, if you like the outdoors, wildlife in general, you just need to even be mildly educated on these issues because they're they not going away. Like, there's not like a... People aren't sitting in Congress idly just like, ah, oh, we're just going to make sure that they continually have places to go recreate outdoors. Like, that's not that's not how things work. So, you know, I feel a pressure personally to try and educate people. And it's it can be frustrating because, like, when you're so passionate about something, it's easy to just, like, want to pull your hair out and be like, no, you're an idiot. Listen to me. But you can't do that or you're going to completely turn them off to it. So the education side of it, I 100% agree with you on it. And this, like the, I don't know. It, I'm continually th- talking to everyone about this and in my own head, like what can we do to make it more friendly? Because hunting hunters can be not the best PR people for themselves sometimes because you're literally like <laughs> outside like holding dead animal. Like nobody likes to see that except for other hunters. So it's kind of, it's a tough yeah. game, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know. <laughs> so many times hunters are their own worst enemies. Yeah. And uh, we really need to be careful about that too. Because that that doesn't help move any needles forward. Yeah. Uh, it is it is tough. But uh, aside from that, you know, there's plenty of issues facing wildlife. You know, I like to try and keep it as positive as possible. You know, is there any great successes that you've seen with it? specifically at Winus, like where you've seen numbers increase or you've helped to bring back some species of duck to the area that haven't been here in a long time. I know you kind of talked, touched on it a little bit earlier, but are there any major success stories about stuff like that? There is. We've got a lot of great success stories. We've had, uh, we've worked closely with a lot of our neighbors, neighboring marshes and community members um, for close to 15 years now on invasive species control. And we've made a huge difference in invasive sp- plant species across the landscape in, in really in Southwest Ohio. Um, and I have people that visit here, you know, from Southeast Michigan and from, um, from Wisconsin. And they, they talk about the, you know, they can see it. They can see that there's hardly any phragmites in places and there's hardly any flowering rush and stuff in places. So we've made, a huge difference on that front. Um, and I also like to think that a lot of the research that we're doing here at Winus Point is, is making a big difference. Uh, the last couple of years, we've had big projects on shorebirds. We've had big projects on uh, secretive marsh birds. 
um, like like rails, bitterns, and, and gallinules. Um, and we've contributed a ton to the to the science about those species. You know, those those species are in population declines, and we've contributed a ton of information and and research to the science on those. And I think helped develop conservation plans for those too. So, yeah, there's a lot of success stories as well. Well, there is. I've been very lucky, in my own opinion, to like just by the stars aligning being born here in Ohio. And, you know, I, I grew up, I was born in, in Toledo. I moved f- for a good chunk of my young life until I was about 20 to Southeast Michigan. And then I moved back to Ohio. And this region has taught me a huge appreciation for conservation and wildlife. And I think a lot of people take that for granted that live here, especially outdoorsmen and women that are into the outdoors at all. Because when you think Northwest Ohio, you're not thinking like, oh, yeah, I'm in the Smokies. We got these mountain ranges and all this pristine land. I mean, people think corn and they think algal blooms and all this stuff. But the amount of conservation work and the people I've been able to talk to just in the last year – that do conservation work here in North Ohio, there's massive, massive projects going on continually for wildlife habitat restoration, you know, wildlife conservation. And I, just like with Winus Point, like I, I probably would have never heard of you if I have not dived down this rabbit hole because I, I wasn't into duck hunting or something. But like the work that everyone's doing collectively on a scale, like even like a, a, in the United States or globally is, is massive. There's so much conservation work going on here locally and you have a lot of partners you work with to to do all of this great conservation work so i know um you've done a podcast with ducks unlimited probably i think a few times but you know what's your relationship with ducks unlimited because i know they they have a pretty big role around here as well with with conservation like big yeah time. they have a they have a really big role around here with conservation they've they've delivered a lot of of conservation projects on state and really a lot on, on private lands around here too, which is huge. Um, like you say, there's Ducks Unlimited, us, the Nature Conservancy and, and Black Swamp Bird Observatory and a few others you've had on your podcast. There's a ton of great partners in this region and we all work together. Um, and yeah, you're right. Huge projects, million, millions and millions of dollars in conservation funding. Uh, a lot of it associated with the coastal marshes along here. Um, so yeah, do a, do a lot of great things. Um, yeah. Ducks Unlimited. I I I worked for them for several years, and they helped uh, fund my graduate project. And yeah, I've got a lot of friends there and, and close connections, so I enjoy working with them. Yeah, great organizations all around here. I, I I just keep finding more every day, and I just absolutely love it. Like. You know, when I started this podcast, I was talking to everyone but people here locally. And now it's just like I've I've talked to people here all day long, like between Ohio and Michigan. I could run this podcast unlimited for the rest of time, probably just talking to different conservation organizations. But uh, on a personal note, you know, I'm a huge like proponent of, you know, finding things to do locally and, you know, I've started doing more like even around my house, there's tons of reservoirs and stuff out in the middle of farm country, Fulton County area and, and stuff like that. And exploring, is there any regions or places locally? It doesn't have to be what, specific to Winus or anything that you really like to kind of even just go out and enjoy not hunting, not fishing or, or hunting and fishing. Any spots around Northwest Ohio that you really, really enjoy? Uh, one, one area of Northwest Ohio that that's, off in the corner of, of Northwest Ohio is Lake La Suanne wildlife area, uh, all the way out, like almost to Indiana. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, it's a great place. There, there's some beautiful, uh, mature forest there. And, um, like the fishing's great out of that area. So I really enjoy it out there. Uh, obviously I spend a ton of time around here locally on the marshes and stuff. And, uh, um, I spend quite a bit of time, just recreating out on on Lake Erie too, you know. That's that's a that's a huge resource that we shouldn't forget about around here. There's some beautiful areas on Lake Erie. Lake Erie is so awesome. <laughs> I, yeah. There's no other way to put it. I mean, I know people that are terrified of the Maumee River because like the farm runoff and all this stuff, and the d- water's a little dark. And then you even get out into the Maumee Bay and and a little bit past Oregon and stuff, and the water from that outflow can be a little discolored but i mean when you get out there a few miles into lake erie it's like blue green it's like you're in the middle of the ocean you go out of the islands and it's just like 
I could be in, I could feel like I'm in Florida right now or something like just mind blowing, beautiful, Great Lakes, like in rare form. Like I just love the Great Lakes. Like I have no desire to ever go to Florida again, you know, cause it's like, there's so much to do here. There's so many awesome species to, to go after, you know, even if their numbers aren't in the trillions and billions like they used to be. I mean, there's still great fishing. There's so much to do here, but I also do like to get out and travel. You know, I go to Texas every year for a, a conference with good buddies of mine and we hunt down there. And uh, is there any places around the United States that you really either want to go to or uh, you've been that you like really enjoy hunting, fishing, whatever? Well, uh, every spring I spend quite a bit of time in, in all sorts of different areas of Southeast Ohio, uh, you know, turkey hunting and morale hunting and, and yeah. just generally enjoying Southeast Ohio. That's a, that's a, a beautiful part of the state, I think, probably my favorite part of the state of Ohio. Um, I grew up in Canada, in Ontario, on the other side of Lake Erie, um, and I spent, a, you know, my whole childhood hunting and fishing in, in sort of central Ontario, thousands of lakes and, and millions of acres of public land. Um, so I also like to get back up to there whenever I can, too. So, so that's kind of my, my uh, stomping grounds as, as yeah. far as hunting and fishing and, and hiking. Well, with, with Canada specifically, I've uh, had another guest on uh, from Canada, and she kind of moved to the United States when she was a little older, and she got really into hunting. How different is hunting and fishing in Canada? I mean, obviously, if it's you're in the Great Lakes region, you're going to have great hunting and fishing. But, like, law-wise, I think I don't know the differences in what it takes to hunt up in Canada versus the United States. That's not something I've, I've never been to Canada to hunt. I've only been there for, you know, like to see Niagara Falls or something. So, yeah, uh, as far as laws go, I, I mean, it's more or less the same, you know, every state has its own, you know, unique nuances to the game laws and so and fishing and hunting laws. So obviously you have to pay attention to that, but it's more or less the same um, procedure. There's a few, there's a few extra firearms laws in uh, Canada that you gotta, they're, they're easy to take care of, but you have to have a license to possess a firearm, even if you're borrowing one in Canada. Um, but I really do enjoy, uh, hunting and fishing up there. It's, it's, a, uh, it's different. The, the, um, fishing, especially in Northern Ontario is, it, it's not even the same thing. It's a different sport than down here. You know, there's just so many places and so many fish and, um, so much more or so much less pressure uh, on the fish that it, it it's very, very different than fishing around here. I've, I've noticed, I've started to notice that the more I've branched out in where I'm fishing and things of that nature or hunting or whatever, I, the first couple of years I hunted, I just, my father-in-law owns, you know, some farm properties, got like your classic 10 acre wood lot in the middle of a cornfield. And there's, they're like stacked up right next to each other, 10 acre lot, 10 acre lot, 10 acre lot, probably 10 acres apart from each other. Like there's just a big grid pattern of farming out here. And especially during gun week, there is so much pressure. Like I could go out there for gun week and not even see a deer. And then conversely, I started the Metro parks around here have a program where you can sign up and you can get entered into a lottery system. And if you get drawn, you can get a hunting spot, private piece of land, only you and like two other people can hunt there, only two people at a time. Very low pressure because they're not areas that are continually being walked through or there are not a lot of trails and things. The hunting is insanely different. So I can't imagine going that far north where there's like hardly any pressure because I fished a reservoir the other day and I was literally had my fish finder. I was tracking hundreds of fish stacked up below me and I could not get them to bite because people are fishing there all day, every day. And they've seen every trick in the book. They're like, no, nah, I'm good. So I can't imagine. I would love to get up there and fish someday. I bet the walleye are probably like as 
six foot long or <laughs> there's just there's just so many of them and relatively speaking they're so easy to catch it's it's just a whole different game i i don't fish very much at all in ohio or in the united states um mostly because i got too many other things taking up my time <laughs> but also because you know it's just it's just not what what i'm used to and what i grew up doing and i would just rather go back home and fish once or twice a year yeah. i still i want to catch a giant northern pike like that's what on my bucket list and i'm hoping to make it happen this winter ice fishing do you do a lot of ice fishing up there in canada yeah so i i grew up doing tons of ice fishing and i lived in michigan and ice fish for a while and Ironically enough, the the biggest northern pike I ever caught was in Michigan, not in Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> I just love ice fish. I don't know why. I, in my opinion, it's the superior form of fishing to me. I just absolutely love it. I don't know. I can't explain why because I love doing all this stuff to begin with. But ice fishing is just its own different thing. I don't know what it is about it. I absolutely love it. But um, before you know, we wrap up here. I'll give you a chance. Is there anything that you would like people to know about Winus uh, that maybe they aren't aware of or any kind of stuff that you're really excited about for the future of the club and the the conservancy and all of that? Yeah, you know, um, just what I'm really excited about is the Winus Point Marsh Conservancy, you know, and all the research and conservation and education we're doing. Um, all the great partnerships we have here in the region. I mean, we've talked about all this, but there's a ton of opportunity there. And our our organization, the Marsh Conservancy, just keeps growing and growing and doing more and expanding and getting more involved in, in the community and in regional conservation programs. And it's, it's super exciting for me, uh, you know, for my pro- professional career to see that growth and, and to really play a big part in that. Yeah, and if if someone was interested in maybe becoming part of the club or, you know, learning more, what is there a process to join? Like what does that look like or is it like kind of very limited? I'm not quite I don't I don't belong to any club, so I'm not sure how those work. Well, the the shooting club, the hunting membership, yeah, that's that's super limited uh, by invitation only and, you know, there's there's not a, there's nothing I can do to help anyone with that mm-hmm. um, that's interested. Um, as far as the Marsh Conservancy goes, uh, we have a website that people can go to and get our, our contact information. It's it's uh, winus, W-I-N-O-U-S dot O-R-G. Um, my email and some of our contact info should be on there. Um, we're not open to the public, so we don't have like a whole lot of, you know, just stop in and, and do stuff opportunities. But you can always contact us about volunteer opportunities, find out about some of the programs that are going on here, programs that our partners have here, like the Black Swamp Bird Tours. Um, I can get people information on that uh, or people information on volunteering if they're interested in coming out and seeing some of the research that we're doing and helping on that. Well, absolutely. So if you're interested and you're listening to this, uh, if you want to volunteer, it's always a good thing. It's always worth your time to volunteer, especially for wildlife conservation and stuff, because Mm -hmm. although it seems like there's just money to be had everywhere, it's really wrapped up in in projects. It's not just like free money floating around, you know. So, you know, organizations are always looking for volunteers to come out and help. So, John, I want to thank you, man. This was a really awesome conversation. I learned a ton. I love learning about where I live. And I hope more people will kind of do the same wherever they live in the United States or Canada or the world, you know, kind of learn about your local wildlife before you start getting to like, I'm not going to go start learning about elk when I barely even know what I'm doing around here with the fish and the deer and the ducks, you know, so like kind of focus in on on your local stuff and and make a change if you can. So I want to appreciate or I want to say thank you and appreciate the work you're doing. It's really important stuff for wildlife, man. Sure. Thank you. And thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for letting people know about all the great conservation organizations here in the region. That They're all important partners of ours, and we're glad to see them succeed. 